Vince McMahon, the mastermind behind the WWE, partnered up with NBC to create a one-of-a-kind, unique football league that had aspirations to one day challenge the NFL's superiority. In today's video, we'll take a look back at the XFL's sudden rise to prominence and its even faster demise after just one season. Before we get started, I want to welcome you to All Sports History. This is where you'll find many sports documentaries on a wide range of sports topics, so please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so you don't miss any of those. Also, my goal for this year is to reach 20,000 subscribers, so if you could do me a favor by sharing this channel with your friends and family and anyone else you think might enjoy sports history, that would be a huge help. Okay, let's get back to today's video. The story of the XFL's original incarnation actually begins in Canada, and more specifically, with the Canadian Football League. During the 1990s, one of the CFL's flagship franchises, the Toronto Argonauts, had been facing sliding attendance amid inconsistent play and a string of ownership changes that made any stability virtually impossible, even though the Argonauts had experienced a mini-dynasty of sorts during the decade, having won the Grey Cup three times in just a six-year period, attendance fell to an average of just over 16,000 per game by the middle of the decade. The CFL felt that the team needed an owner who not only had deep pockets, but could also help market the team and attract more people to games. The league then decided to reach out to none other than billionaire Vince McMahon, the man behind World Wrestling Entertainment Incorporated, otherwise known as WWE. The thought process being, who better than McMahon to come up with wild and innovative ways to get people to come to games? Possibly to the CFL's surprise, not only was McMahon interested in buying a CFL team, he wanted more, much more. He countered with the CFL's offer of buying the Argonauts with buying the entire CFL instead, with the plan to ultimately move the league to the United States. Obviously, that was not what the CFL wanted to hear, nor would they ever agree to such deal as it would be the end of Canadian football as they knew it. During the same time period, the NFL was renegotiating TV rights with their broadcast partners. NBC, who had held the rights to NFL games for over 30 years, suddenly found themselves without the NFL when CBS swooped in and outbid them, giving the NFL $4 billion over an eight-year period. Not long after, NBC began to devise plans to replace the football void in their schedule by creating their own football league that they would have some control over. With McMahon's interest in football at its peak and NBC's need to replace the NFL on their network, the perfect opportunity arose for the two sides to work together. A plan was then hatched where the two sides would split ownership 50-50 with the league starting operations for the 2001 season. How the league planned to separate itself from its much larger competitor, the NFL, was by offering a more exciting, violent, and even sexualized brand of football, more on that a little later. How they would accomplish this was by introducing rule changes and gameplay innovations that would increase the pace of game and make it more appealing to fans. The, the new league was set to be called the XFL, and contrary to popular belief, the X and XFL didn't actually stand for extreme. This was because another league already called themselves the Extreme Football League. So for legal reasons, the X and XFL doesn't officially stand for anything. But McMahon was once quoted saying that, if the NFL stood for the No Fun League, then the XFL stood for the Extra Fun League. While the XFL's initial marketing targeted the NFL as being too traditional and too soft, McMahon and NBC knew that they had no chance of succeeding if they scheduled games head-to-head -head with the NFL. So one of the XFL's key strategies was to fill the gap in the sports calendar during the NFL offseason. The league organized its games in the spring, after the Super Bowl had concluded, and before the start of the NFL preseason. The timing was intended to capitalize on the continued interest in football among fans during the offseason, as well as provide an alternative to other sports that were typically played during the spring, such as basketball and baseball. By positioning itself as a complementary product to the NFL, rather than a direct competitor, the XFL hoped to attract a broad audience of sports fans who were hungry for football content year-round. McMahon's marketing strategy for the league seemed to capitalize off the already successful Attitude Era that the WWE had undergone during the late 1990s. The Attitude Era marked a significant shift in the WWE's programming to a more edgier, mature, and adult version of wrestling. McMahon wanted the XFL to have fewer rules, resulting in fewer penalties, and having the games feature mic'd up players and coaches, and television access to the team's locker rooms. The games would also feature trash-talking public address announcers and suggestively dressed cheerleaders who reportedly were encouraged to date players, a practice that was forbidden in the NFL. 
When asked about the dating rule by ESPN the magazine, McMahon went even as far to say that if a player made a mistake during the game and he happened to be dating one of the cheerleaders, he didn't see a problem if the cheerleader was then interviewed on the sideline and asked if they had done the nasty the night before, implying that the nasty may have had something to do with the player's performance. McMahon would later clarify his remarks saying that he said them in jest, but the mandate for the league was clear in positioning itself as the not-so-family-friendly alternative to the NFL. With the inaugural season set to kick off in February 2001, the broadcast schedule of the games was divided by NBC, UPN, and TNN, with NBC getting most of the marquee matchups in primetime. The league featured eight teams from major U.S. cities and also smaller markets that didn't have professional football at the time. Los Angeles, for instance, while considered a major market, was in the midst of its 21-year drought of NFL football after the Raiders and the Rams left the area in 1995. This made it a seemingly perfect fit for the XFL to fill that void. The league also differentiated itself by foregoing the usual franchise model that other professional sports leagues used and instead opted to have all eight of its teams league-owned and operated. For the marketing and branding of each team, with the exception of the Demons, the league chose to use team names that invoked either emotional instability, like the Memphis Maniacs, Orlando Rage, and Los Angeles Extreme, or some kind of criminal activity like the Las Vegas Outlaws, Chicago Enforcers, the New York New Jersey Hitmen, and the Birmingham Blast. Some controversy arose after the Birmingham Blast name was announced due to the city's tragic history with bombings the most infamous being the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church by the Ku Klux Klan, which killed four African-American girls and injured a dozen more. In another instance, just a few years before the XFL launched, a local abortion clinic in Birmingham was bombed by Eric Rudolph, the same man who bombed the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. With the criticisms, the XFL moved to change the name from the Blast to the Birmingham Thunderbolts instead. The league organized the eight teams into two divisions, East and West. In the West, there was the San Francisco Demons, the Los Angeles Extreme, Las Vegas Outlaws, and the Memphis Maniacs. And in the East, there were the Orlando Rage, Chicago Enforcers, the New York New Jersey Hitman, and the newly renamed Birmingham Thunderbolts. One of the ways that the XFL differentiated itself was by allowing custom nicknames and phrases on players' jerseys. Each player was given the option to choose a personalized nameplate to display on the back of their jersey, allowing fans to easily identify their favorite players and creating a more personal connection between players and fans. The variety of nicknames ranged from the playful, such as the baby boy jersey, to the humorous, he hate me jersey, reflecting on the diverse personalities and backgrounds of the XFL's players. While the jersey nicknames may have been seen by some as a gimmick, they became a memorable part of the XFL's legacy and demonstrated the league's willingness to try new things and take risks. While in some other leagues, individual players had embraced nickname jerseys in the past, it wasn't until the XFL's league-wide usage of nickname jerseys that other leagues, like the NBA and MLB, later began to run promotional one-off events where players could at least temporarily use nicknames for a few games a year. The official XFL game balls were made by Spalding and were predominantly black in color with a red X on it. An issue arose with the game balls, however, when during the course of the season, the players complained that the balls were sometimes hard to grasp and were slippery. That's what she said! <laughs> the XFL remedied this situation by making it routine before games to have the footballs rubbed down with sandpaper to remove the excess slickness. Part of the XFL's initial appeal was its unique rules that distinguished itself from the NFL. One of the most significant changes was the kickoff rule, which required the kicker to kick the ball to the receiving team from their own 30-yard line, while the coverage team lined up on the opposing team's 35-yard line. The goal was to reduce high-speed collisions during kickoffs. Additionally, the XFL allowed for two forward passes on a single play as long as the first pass was completed behind the line of scrimmage. The league also eliminated extra point kicks, requiring teams to either run a play from the 2-yard line for 1 point or from the 5-yard line for 2 points. In an interesting move, the league required all of its stadiums to have natural grass playing surfaces instead of artificial turf. The XFL believed that natural grass would provide a more authentic and safer playing experience for its athletes. This rule essentially prevented teams from using dome stadiums because at the time, most dome stadiums didn't have retractable roofs as many would in the years to come. In fact, the first NFL stadium with a retractable roof would open a year after the XFL's first season when the Texans' Reliance Stadium first opened its doors in Houston in 2002. 
While the XFL prided itself on player safety when it came to playing on natural grass, the league simultaneously introduced a unique pre-game ritual that became nicknamed the Human Coin Toss. In this gimmick, one player from each team would race to grab the football placed at midfield, with the winner gaining the choice to receive or defer the opening kickoff. Not exactly the safest way to decide who gets the ball first, and a player actually separated his shoulder on one of the first races, causing him to miss the rest of the season. In another interesting and possibly cost-saving move, the league decided that the end zones and midfield logos for each game would be XFL branded only, and would not allow teams to create their own individual team designs. This seemed to fly in the face of a league that boasted itself on a unique originality and a near anything goes attitude. A few weeks later, the first two games of the 2001 season took place on February 3rd, 2001, a week after the Baltimore Ravens defeated the New York Giants in Super Bowl 35. The inaugural games featured the New York, New Jersey Hitmen versus the Las Vegas Outlaws and also the Chicago Enforcers visiting the Orlando Rage. The Outlaws ended up defeating the Hitman 19 to nothing in the first game and drew an impressive 14 million viewers on NBC. The first week of ratings drew a 9.5 Nielsen rating, essentially meaning that 9.5% of households in the United States were watching the XFL, which was actually double the viewership numbers that NBC had promised their advertisers. The entirety of the first season ran for 10 weeks, between February and April, with the two top teams in each division qualifying for the playoffs. Because there were only eight teams, and the league didn't want two teams from the same division playing each other in the semifinal round, for the playoffs, the XFL had the number one seed in the Western Division play the number two team in the Eastern Division, and vice versa. The first semifinal game was held at the Citrus Bowl in Orlando, Florida, with the San Francisco Demons narrowly defeating the Orlando Rage 26-25. The second semifinal game was held at the Los Angeles Coliseum, where the LA Extreme beat the Chicago Enforcers 33-16. The XFL Championship game, known as the Million Dollar Game, due to the million dollar prize that would be split amongst the winning team's players, was also held at the LA Coliseum. Interestingly, the Million Dollar Game was not the first name that the XFL came up with for the championship game, as it was originally called the Big Game at the End of the Season. That tells you everything you need to know. In the championship game, the LA Extreme, led by league MVP Tommy Maddox, ended up defeating the San Francisco Demons 38-6 in a blowout game, making the Extreme the first team to win an XFL championship. While the initial ratings for the XFL's first few games were high, interest in the league quickly fell off. The second week of the XFL drew half of the first week's ratings, and by the end of the first season, some XFL games were earning only a 1.5 Nielsen rating. The same was true for in-game attendance. As the season went on, games became less and less attended by fans. This prompted broadcasters to have to get creative in not showing empty stands by focusing only on full sections or by shooting at different angles to hide empty seats. It didn't help either that the league had no real pre-game, halftime, or post-game wrap-up shows to allow audiences to catch up on what was happening. Most of the halftime shows featured head coaches going over strategy and adjustments during live look-ins into players' locker rooms. As ratings began to slip, a desperate McMahon promoted a WWE-inspired promotional stunt that would feature a live look-in into the cheerleaders' dressing room during the halftime of a Week 6 matchup between the Orlando Rage and the Las Vegas Outlaws. In the sketch, McMahon and his cameraman try to force their way into the cheerleaders' dressing room, with McMahon pushing the cameraman into the door and managing to knock him out in the process, which was then followed by a dream sequence with the cheerleaders in bathrobes and also featured a random surprise cameo by Rodney Dangerfield. Predictably, the sketch was considered to be in poor taste and objectifying to women, and led to the league toning down its approach to cheerleading performances in later games. This massive drop in ratings caused both McMahon and NBC to lose $35 million each, only netting 30% of their initial investment into the XFL. NBC, knowing that they'd have a hard time convincing advertisers to pay top dollar for ad placements, quickly pulled out of their deal to show XFL games at the conclusion of the first season, even though they had a two-year deal to broadcast games. So on May 10, 2001, not even three full weeks after the million dollar game, the XFL announced that it would be shutting down for good. Unfortunately, this left the hardcore fans of the league, like Darth Ball here, now streaming on Disney+, Plus, without any XFL football for the foreseeable future, and confusing those who weren't exactly in the loop. I know Marge, I'm waiting for the new XFL season! Who will win this year's million dollar game? Who? Who? Honey... The X is for extreme! There is no XFL this year. The league folded. Who is it? Who told you? Last year's MVP. He sweeps up toenails at the beauty parlor.
While there were numerous reasons that contributed to the leak's sudden and swift downfall, I believe that there were two major reasons that played a factor, the first being the overall quality of play, or lack thereof. Most of the XFL players were guys who were trying to make the NFL at one point or another and had not yet made it. Even with the high ratings for Week 1, NBC Sports president Dick Ebersole was not satisfied with the quality of play on the field. He even let some of the network's most established on-air talent, like Bob Costas, opt out of covering the XFL if they chose to, though Costas did later interview McMahon in a contentious back and forth over the XFL's sinking ratings. With the exception of a few, most of the on-air talent for XFL games were young, unknown broadcasters mixed in with WWE stars doing color commentating, a fact that didn't help lend credibility to the league that at that point was desperately trying to earn. Which brings me to what I believe to be the second major reason for the XFL's failure, which was its perceived phoniness due to its WWE association. As soon as the league launched, there were jokes and rumors that the XFL games might be fake or that it was rigged somehow, which turned out to be unfounded. But what had been a strength to McMahon with wrestling, with the over-the-top showmanship and building storylines around star wrestlers, proved to be a detriment when it came to football. At the end of the day, people just really wanted to watch the games, and to be entertained by the exciting play on the field, and not by whatever antics were happening on the sidelines or in the locker room. In the years since the XFL's first season ended in 2001, interest in launching a legitimate spring football league has only grown. There have been a countless number of leagues that have sprung up, only to fold for one reason or another after just a few seasons. In 2017, ESPN revisited the XFL with their 30 for 30 documentary on the league's failures in 2001. The documentary interviewed many of the key decision makers at the time, including Vince McMahon and Dick Ebersole. In fact, Ebersole's son, Charlie, directed the documentary and even went on to create the Alliance of American Football League, which later folded in 2019. The 30 for 30 documentary spurred a renewed interest in the XFL for McMahon, who in 2018 announced that a new incarnation of the XFL would debut in early 2020. This time, however, it would be different, with McMahon promising a more serious, updated take on football rather than trying to upstage the NFL with its WWE-inspired stunts. Because this was considered a total reboot from the 2001 XFL, none of the original teams were brought back. The new lineup of teams for the 2020 season included the Dallas Renegades, the DC Defenders, the Houston Roughnecks, the Los Angeles Wildcats, the New York Guardians, the Seattle Dragons, the St. Louis Battlehawks, and the Tampa Bay Vipers. The season kicked off on February 8, 2020, with eight teams divided into two divisions, playing a 10-game regular season schedule. The league received some initial hype with decent TV ratings and fan attendance, but in an unforeseen turn of events, the season was cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many other sports leagues were forced to temporarily shut down as well and ended up truncating their seasons. However, the XFL later announced on March 20th, 2020 that the remainder of the season would be canceled. This was a huge blow to the XFL as the shutdown caused the league to lose tens of millions of dollars. Just three weeks after canceling the season, the XFL announced that it was suspending all operations permanently and filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. As part of the bankruptcy process, the XFL would have to sell off all of its assets, with McMahon agreeing that he would not try to buy back the league. Later that summer, just before the XFL was to go to an auction sale, former WWE star Dwayne The Rock Johnson and his business partners Danny Garcia and Jerry Cardinal, seen here standing next to the Incredible Hulk for no apparent reason, bought the league for $15 million. Putting the WWE connections aside, The Rock was also a former college football player who had dreams of making it to the NFL. So understandably, getting the chance to buy the XFL felt like the perfect once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for him. On August 21, 2020, the sale was officially formalized with the new ownership later announcing that the XFL would once again make its return in 2022. Over the next year and a half, the XFL held brief discussions with the Canadian Football League about possible ways that the two leagues could work together or even possibly merge. But after months of ongoing talks, the two sides couldn't come to an agreement on any plan to move forward together. By this point, the XFL decided to pause the relaunch for 2022, saying that they would return in the spring of 2023 instead. It was announced that most of the teams from the 2020 season would return, with the exception of the LA Wildcats, who were replaced by the San Antonio Brahmas. There were also a couple of relocations, with the Tampa Bay Vipers moving to Las Vegas and the New York Guardians moving to Orlando. The 2023 season kicked off on February 18th, and just like the past seasons, the initial first weeks were well received, although halfway through the season, TV ratings were down overall somewhat as compared to the 2020 season. 
The season made it to the end and concluded on May 13, 2023, with the Arlington Renegades defeating the DC Defenders 35-26 in the first XFL championship in over 20 years. The jury is almost certainly still out on the prospect of the XFL's longevity, but as of the recording of this video, the XFL has already stated that there will be a 2024 season for the league. While the original XFL's existence was relatively brief, the league featured a number of notable players who went on to have successful careers in professional football. Perhaps the most well-known XFL alum is quarterback Tommy Maddox, who, as mentioned, won the league's most valuable player in 2001 before going on to play in the NFL for several seasons. Other notable players included running back Rod Smart, also known as He Hate Me, who went on to play in the NFL and CFL, and linebacker Paris Lennon, who was the last active former 2001 XFL player to play in the NFL in 2013. The XFL also provided opportunities for players who may have otherwise gone overlooked by NFL teams and helped launch the careers of several players who went on to have successful playing time in the Arena Football League and other alternative football leagues. Despite its short-lived existence, the XFL left a lasting legacy on professional football. The league's innovative approach to rule changes and on-field elements have influenced the NFL and other professional football leagues. For example, the XFL's use of the Skycam for overhead shots of the game has become a staple for NFL broadcasts. The league also experimented with a unique sound experience with the use of on-field microphones to capture the in-game sounds and provide commentary from the sidelines, creating a more immersive and entertaining experience for the viewers. They also utilized their own sound system for an in-person game experience using a high phonic speaker support pole in the corners of the field, which are more commonly used for concerts. This added dimension amplified the sounds on the field to the crowd in the stands, providing a fresh take on a traditional game viewing experience. Additionally, the league's focus on player personalities and individuality has become more prevalent in the sport, with players being allowed to customize their uniforms and celebrate touchdowns in unique ways. The XFL's failure also served as a cautionary tale for other professional sports leagues, highlighting the difficulties of launching a new league and gaining a foothold in the crowded sports market. While the XFL may not have succeeded in its initial goal of challenging the NFL's dominance, its impact on the sport of football continues to be felt today. So what did you think about the original XFL folding after only one season? Do you think that the XFL will finally last as a legitimate spring football league? Let me know in the comments below. Also, you can now support the channel by leaving a super thanks anytime you want to comment. This would be greatly appreciated and would go a long way in helping the channel out. So thanks for supporting the channel and thanks for watching.